Greetings everyone, Christian Barker here and welcome. Um, today I've got the enormous pleasure and privilege of uh, speaking with um, one of American music's greats, a pioneer of the style of music known as House, um, Mr. Jesse Saunders, the man who uh, released the very first house music records named On and On back in 1983. Jesse joining us right now. This is really exciting for me. I hope it's exciting for you too. Here we go, Mr. Saunders. Welcome. How are you doing? <laughs> Welcome. Awesome to be speaking with you. I'm doing okay for, for 6.30 in the morning. I'm more of a late night guy than an early morning guy. You're probably, uh, probably a little bit the same. Well, that's the, that's the time difference, so, yeah. <laughs> that's how it is. So you're, you're, you're living in, uh, in Las Vegas now, is that correct? Yeah, I'm between Las Vegas and L.A. Okay. Um, how, how do you like it out there on the West Coast? West Coast? Well, there's no other place to live as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> very, 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 very good. Now, of course, um, I mean, for anyone who's unfamiliar with you, um, one of the greats of, uh, of Chicago house music, which originated uh, there back in, uh, back in the early, early 1980s. And, uh, and yeah, you've just uh, released a, uh, a new book called In Their Own Words, um, tracking very much the earliest days of, uh, of house music and, and its evolution from, uh, you know, sort of the transformation from disco music into, uh, into house and, and how things have, have progressed over the, over the gene, the 40 years um, since. What was, what was the inspiration for, uh, for writing this book or for putting this book together? Uh, you know, I've done hundreds if not thousands of features and documentaries and TV shows and whatnot, and they're always the same thing. It's always the same people saying the same things, and I just got tired of it, so I wanted to do something different. Okay. I wanted to approach the subject from a different angle and not from the, the usual suspect, so to say. So I didn't want the same celebrity pioneers and, you know, people like myself saying the same things. You know, I've even gotten to the point... With my, with when people ask me about a doc, doing a documentary or, or a feature or something like that, where I'm just my usually my answer is no, because I know exactly what it's going to be because we've already done it and we've already said it, and it's just like why do we need to keep repeating the same things over and over again? Sure. It's just unnecessary as I'm concerned. So, with this particular venture, I wanted to share a different side, which to me would be the most important side, which is, which are the people who actually made house music and made a scene for it and made it turn into a, a global phenomenon as we know it today. You know, everyone thinks it's, uh, you know, the Louis Vegas and the, you know, Carl Cox's and Tiestos of the world. It's like, no, they, they didn't make it. They came along afterwards. They weren't even there at the beginning, you know. It was the people who started to get together at smaller events, smaller gatherings, even high school parties. It's like people want to trace it back to the warehouse and things like that, but that's not really where it started. That was a byproduct kind of of the disco age that you had the warehouse and you had the Paradise Garage and whatnot. But the global phenomenon on house music as we know it today came about because young teenagers who wanted something different or were able, at the time you were able to gather in crowds at places and warehouses and lofts and meatpacking districts and all kinds of stuff. And there was no curfew. So we could actually stay out as long as we want to. We could play music. There were no cops coming to shut it down. There were no, you know, licenses or nothing. So it was a, a glory day unlike we've ever really seen because now, you know, you have to have a, numerous permits and you have to have police involved and medical and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, we didn't have to do that. We just picked up one day and decided we want to, if we wanted to have it at the beach, we'd set up at the beach and have a party all night at the beach. If we wanted to be in a warehouse, we did that. So, in other words, that whole scene developed from people wanting to express themselves with a, a style of music that allowed them the freedom to do so. So, and because, you know, when I'm talking about disco into the house music age into the rave age and so on and so forth. All of that was founded on the principle that we can set up and dance anywhere we want to, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. 
You know, you don't have a, a criminal justice bill yet. You don't have a rave act. You don't have any of that stuff to stop you. So you just do whatever you want to do. So basically, why I wrote this book was because those stories from those people back in those days that, that did that and were able to live that, that legacy, so to say, are the ones that I want to hear the real stories for because how they got there, what type of people they hung out, who they met, you know, friendships that they've made and relationships that they've had through the years that have led them to whoever they are today and what they've done in life and so on. And so those are the real stories of house music. It's not what DJ played for what crowd and did. who cares? We see that every day. I want to hear your, your story. You know, where did Christian Barker first hear house music? Well, I'm way more interested in that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and, 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 and it's interesting that you, you know, you point out that it was about um, about young kids. You know, I, I probably first got into uh, house music at, at the age of 15 and sort of, or 14, 15, like 1989, 1990. And that was in Sydney, Australia, going to, and a lot of it was, you know, illegal raves in, in warehouses and things. And I was obviously deeply underage um, and there were also kind of underage club nights where uh, where the music was being um, was being played as well but the thing that blew my mind reading the book and as you know I've, I've read the book over the over the last week um, was as you say you know some of these earliest parties we've all heard about you know the warehouse and stuff um, but it was it was it was the parties at, at Mendel's Catholic school you know where you had um, you had the, the priests and the nuns, I think one of the stories, were, were, were on the door collecting the money from these, you know, um, little teenage kids who were coming to this, uh, this underage party. And that was one of the, you know, the, the wellsprings of, of this culture. Amazing. I am. Well, you know, again, in those days, you didn't, I mean, one of the stories in there by Stephanie Johnson, she's originally from Chicago, and she grew up in that scene, says that it, it kind of summed the whole thing up for us. We were teenagers and we were allowed to live like adults we could stay out all night your parents didn't worry about you because you know you weren't going to get into anything except you'd be dancing with your friends all night so it wasn't like you know you had to be in at a curfew or a certain hour and you had to do this it was like just go have fun you know and you can't really do that today it's kind of like you have to have all of these things and restrictions in place and parents are constantly worried about you and you know probably so because this is a different world now it's a a more dangerous world, so to say. Back then, we didn't have a care in the world, and nothing happened to anybody, so we were fine. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, yeah. I, how, I, particularly, I think you know, living in in Las Vegas, um, it will be it will be very clear to you, you know, that that this this music, you know, I, I suppose now has has kind of evolved a lot of it into into this sort of EDM culture with these uh, you know superstar DJs. How has it been for you? observing um this 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 culture this music you know really evolved from back in your earliest days you know super kind of diy basement um do it yourself kind of very very scrappy into into this thing where you know now you've got as you say djs like like a tiesto or calvin harris or whatever chain smokers whatever and these guys are making like 20 million 40 million dollars a year crazy crazy uh sums of money did you ever dream that it would uh, that it would uh, evolve into into what it is well no i mean how could you possibly you know um i remember when i first started as a teenager as a dj you were stuck in some closet in the back somewhere and you played for six seven eight hours and you made fifty dollars if you were lucky so you know nobody cared about the dj you were just someplace where they came and asked for a request you know it was like <laughs> if they even paid any attention to you at all basically but so no i could have never as a matter of fact after I started getting into production and making records, I kind of stopped DJing for a while because to me it's like, well, you know, it's fun, but there's no money in it. I need something that's going to pay the bills kind of thing. And that's where songwriting and production did that. I mean, bigger and better than I could have ever imagined, you know. And it's funny because production and writing back then was worth so much more money. Your budgets, I mean, we're talking minimum twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 budgets just to do a remix or a song, you know. You would never get that now, you know. Basically, everyone wants everything for free. Mm -hmm. But it's flipped 
where we weren't making money as DJs, but we'd make it as, as producers and songwriters. Now it's more like we'll make it as DJs and we don't make as much as producers and songwriters. Even though, you know, publishing will always be the largest part of the music business. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I try to educate most people on is understanding your worth and holding on to your copyrights. Because even though they don't seem like they're valuable right now, in the long run, they will be your best asset. So I can truly say that from a standpoint of, you know, some of the songs that I wrote and hits and some that have been platinum or gold or whatever 25, 30 years ago are still paying me today, mm. you know, and it's, you know, you look at something like a quarantine where people are losing jobs, especially, you know, music people, it's like, how are you going to survive? Well, I'm good. If I never made another record and never did anything ever again in life, I'm fine just because of my back catalog, you know? So it's a really important that people understand the worth of their copyrights because most people don't know that side. They, they just want to make a track or they want to make a remix and put it out or whatever. And it's like you really need to understand the work and know it probably won't pay you right now. But if you can hang around for 10 years, it'll probably be worth a whole lot more. Yeah, that's your 401k, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, 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 my eldest daughter, who's only 11, um, but, you know, she, she wants to grow up to be a, um, a musician, a, a performer. And, and I always say to her, the most <laughs> Um, you know, you got to have that publishing. That's all about it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's God, the sun, the sun is crazy. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the, uh, you, you know, look, speak, speaking of, obviously right now we're going through this, this huge crisis and the way things have transformed with, with no one, you know, really buying physical records anymore, the way most performers, most musicians, um, make a living these days is through is through live performance which is you know really kind of uh, that style has been has been crimped at the moment how, how are you seeing um, your fellow performers and, and musicians and entertainers uh, surviving through this uh, this period where uh, where people are, are less able uh, to go out and uh, and enjoy themselves at clubs or concerts well I think it's actually a good thing, to be honest. I, I started an entity called the Electronic Music Cafe about 10 years ago, and we were really like some of the first to stream DJs live. But we didn't just, you know, turn on a camera and play music, you know, on a live feed. We included art, artists, models, you name it. We made it part of the whole scene where we even like incorporated art on the, the movements of the hands or arms or body of the DJ playing music. So it, it seemed like a whole piece of art that was playing music and whatnot. It took a, a whole lot more back then, obviously, a lot more equipment, a lot of encoders and so on and so forth. It wasn't like you just plug in and turn on your live and, and you're now live. It took a lot of production value where it's simple now, but it was fun. The only problem was it was there was not really much of a way to monetize it yet. I mean, there was, but to get people to tune in and actually either pay for or donate was, like, very difficult in those days. Now it's kind of a standard, especially with, you know, like, with this quarantine going on. Most people put up their cash app and their PayPal link and whatnot, and people would donate. I have a friend, I have some friends that own a club here in Las Vegas that is called the uh, Fremont Country Club, and it's also a... Uh, Triple B, which is they do a lot of like bands, electronic bands, alternative bands, you name it, and, and they pack the house. I mean, one of the venues holds 400 people, the other one holds 1,200 people, and it's always packed. So since the, we've been down, they obviously haven't been able to do shows. So what they started doing is sinking some money into live stream equipment and cameras and setting up the stage and the venue so that they can actually live stream bands playing live. And some of these bands now, they're they're getting twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars just donated for them playing. So they're actually making money now. And I think for me, especially at this stage of my career where, you know, I've pretty much flown and been everywhere. So it's not like I feel the need to have to go back there anymore. It's like I can just as soon stay home in my own studio and just broadcast live and I'll be perfectly happy. So for me, it's, it's great because they've asked me to do the, um, the house music channel on there. So I'm now in the process of trying to figure out how to get some good content because we want a lot, a lot of live content. Of course, some of it will be pre-recorded or whatever, but I want show. I'm not really interested in DJ sets everybody's doing that mm -hmm. so we don't i don't want dj just playing music because you also run into another problem which a lot of live streaming djs have, have learned which is 
copyright infringement. You're playing other people's music and you don't have a license, that's copyright infringement. And they're all like, why are they stopping us and taking this down? It's like, because you're playing my music or, or whomever else's music and you're not paying for it. Well, why should we have to pay for it? I already paid for it when I downloaded it. It's like, no, you didn't. All you did was bought the right to be able to play it for yourself. But if you play it for other people, then that's another license. Uh, and they don't understand that, you know. Uh, no. It's the question that I that I had for you is, um, you know, with with everything having transformed, uh, you know, first into MP3s um, and now into into streaming, is is it? And it's something that struck me reading the book. You know, reading all those stories of uh, of young DJs really having to work hard, digging in the crates, going to the import record stores, hunting down the right records. You know, and and there were days where there's one story where I think the shop has like five copies of On and On. And the guy gets to like the last one in the store. Is it is it too easy now to to collect all of the music in the world? You know, this this phone I'm talking into now, I've got access to virtually every song ever made in all of history on there. Whereas thirty years ago I had to like go out and, and you know, hunt down these imports and white labels and, and you know, um, really work hard and spend hard to to get the music. Mm -hmm. Too easy now? Well, I mean, I love it. I love the fact that I don't have to drive to a record store, find parking, sure. go through hundreds of records to try to find the one that I actually like. And I love it because now I can just sit at home and just go through this, stream a little bit of that. Nope, don't like that. Go to the next one. Nope, don't like that. Like, it's a lot easier. So I, I actually like it. The part that's that's most difficult about it, though, is the fact that now that the platform is accessible for anyone to make music as well as hear it. You have too many people that, and I hate to say that, but it's really the truth. You have too many people that are trying to make music that don't have a clue about how to make music or write a song, clogging up all of the musical channels for the people who are professional and do it the proper way. So consequently, it's harder to get noticed and harder to get seen. You know, I, for one, you know, have belonged to pools and stuff my whole life. But in recent years, you know, you, I get hundreds of requests of people trying to put me on their mailing list and I have to say no because they send me all of this stuff and none of it I'm ever going to play. So why do I need to go through it? You know, it's like if I want something, I tell everybody, I will ask you for it. Don't send it to me, you know, because I refuse to have my email clogged up with it. I refuse to listen to a bunch of stuff that I know I'm not going to like because I'm very specific in what I play and what I'll break and so on and so forth. Plus uh, the fact that like I play most of my own music and stuff too and or people that I either collaborate or work with and stuff that I know is top level type stuff. Because, you know, too many people now in their quest to try to be producers or remixers, they're doing what I call the one loop type of, you know, things where it's just the same thing over and over again. I hate that. It's like, ooh, have some creativity. Give me some sort of progression. Give me some peaks and valleys. Set me up. Take me on a ride. If I don't have that, then the answer's already no if you don't do that. You know, I don't care how good a song or what great. If you don't give me that, I'm just not going to play it. Simple as that, you know. And I have, like, my Global House show I do every week, and I have pretty much feature... 95% new music. I don't play old stuff because to me and, and the whole ideal of me being a DJ my whole entire career was always to break new music or get my audience into something that's new and fresh and more progressive or whatever and to give you new ideas. I don't need to sit there and play the same thing over and over again. There are hundreds of thousands of DJs that will do that for you. You're not, Don't come listen to me for that because I'm not going to give it to you. You know, and like on one of the stations that I do a show here on Vegas, we have some other people and they love playing a lot of the older stuff. So I'm, I'm like, great, because all I'm going to play is new, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it, it tends to work out in, in different forms or fashion or whatever. But no, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not a fan of sitting there and going through a bunch of music trying to find that one gem. It was great back in the day because it was new and, you know, most, most of the records that were being put out, because think about it, now you can have a software program, make a track, upload it to SoundCloud or whatever, all of this is basically free. 
it doesn't cost you a dime, right? So anything can be out there that anybody can hear at any time. Well, back in the day, if you wanted to put something out, you had to go through a lot of channels and spend a lot of money. So believe me, people that weren't professional at it and, and really wanted to make a statement, we're not going to do it because it required a big investment. You know, and I almost feel like that's what kind of separated the gr- the good great stuff from the bad stuff. Mm. You know, because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put thousand two thousand dollars into something that I don't think is just the best thing or the my best foot forward. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're missing, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I I agree with you, and and you know, I think there's also the the fact that um the you know vinyl records beautiful as they are and and great as they sound um they take up a hell of a lot of room and they're they're damn heavy to to carry around i've got a i've got (laughs) australia full of thousands of vinyl records that are you know um Mm -hmm. hard to to transport hard to hard to um hard to store um and and you know i think the great thing with with spotify and stuff as as with many people you know i i think i Stopped kind of listening to to new music, unfortunately, when I when I reached my kind of late thirties, and then Spotify came along and really started exposing me to a hell of a lot of uh, of new stuff and recommendations based on the old stuff that I was into. So you know that's been uh, that's been good, and I'm sure I'm certainly you know not alone in that. So uh, there are advantages, but uh, how how do you find the the revenue from from streaming as opposed to um, to back in the day when it was all physical. Oh my God. You know, I don't even want to talk about it. It's so depressing. Yeah. You know, I come from a time when, you know, like the days of Love Can't Turn Around and later on, you know, when, when other songs and whatnot, where we would sell just records alone. In Chicago, we could do 20, 25,000 units within the first few weeks. Easy, not even think about it. To a time where you can put something out, and if you get five hundred downloads, you're happy about it. Yeah, you know, it's just no. You know, my my BMI checks Broadcast Music Incorporated, which is a performing arts organization. I've been with them for thirty years, and I've seen my best times were the late eighties, the nineties, into the early two thousand. I noticed a noticeable drop in my royalties from about. 2005 to about 2010 I mean like a noticeable drop because you know I've done lots of film TV shows and things like that and that's where the real money is is in licensing sync licenses and things like that and I've done tons of those in those days my BMI checks they come quarterly I mean we're talking five figures easy every time I get one a quarter and I've gone from that to barely if I get Four figures, I'm lucky. Right. So that's a very noticeable drop, and it, it really pisses me off. Is people don't understand where I'm coming from, especially the you know more new school producers and DJs. You know why I'm so adamant about copyrights and you know and and performing rights and things like that. And they're thinking like, well, you know, we the new age is we sample stuff and we take this. I was like, yeah, but you still aren't doing it legally. Mm. It, you can't just take someone's stuff and reformulate it and cut it up and say it's yours. It's not yours. It's theirs. Yeah. It's whoever wrote that owns the copyright to it. Well, no, I repurposed it. I'm like, yeah, but it's still somebody else's thing. Now, you take something that you made and do that, and it's fine. But you can't use other people's other people's intellectual property without paying them for it. Period. So I've been, you know, involved with a lot of the rights organizations and the copyright things. To I mean, you look at Track Source and, and Bport. That's all that's on there is sampling somebody else's thing and making something different for the most part. And people, the the part that I that I get the most pissed off at is that they take somebody else's thing and then they put their name on it, and you see no no recognition, no copyright no publishing nothing of the original songwriter and publisher yeah yeah you know and they don't they don't understand that that's not right they think that oh that's the way it's done it's like no you're that's copyright infringement and if i got a real bug up my butt i'd take you to court and sue you but you're just not making enough on it for it to even warrant that i mean i've done it a couple of times to people just to prove a point for the principal but it costs me more money than i'll get out of it but it's really all it's going to be Cease and desist. But those examples mm-hmm. are right back to you know even even a song like Black Box, right on time, where I remember you know mm-hmm. they were there denying they were saying no this isn't Lolita Holloway and it was like 
guys. It's it's pretty obvious. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had people I've had people ask me questions like, "Well, if you only use like two seconds of it, then that's legal." It's like, no, it's not. You're still using it. You can't use any of it at all without the permission of the songwriter or publisher. Period. You just can't. Precisely. <laughs> well, you know. And James Brown had had sort of teams of lawyers uh, in that early period of mm -hmm. out there finding those those two second drum breaks and saying, "Pay up, please." Um, but mm -hmm. I've had just real quick. I've had I've talked to George Clinton and I've talked to people like Holland Dozier Holland, who've written you know numerous hits from Motown to the Funk Age, you name it. And they said their best time in the business has been since people started sampling. They said that that's kept their catalogs going for so long. It's just unbelievable because what they do is, you know, they already made money off of the songs and they're still getting big royalty checks. So people started using it and they, same thing, they hire lawyers and they hire people they would call, um, so, what do they call them, song, well, song monitors, that wasn't the term, but just for lack of a better word, they would just, all anything that came out, they would just sit there and listen. All Anything that was on the charts and everything, as soon as they found one thing that sounded one bit familiar, they would go after them and so on. Yeah. And then, of course, whoever owned it would have to relinquish the rights to it because if you clear it ahead of time, then you could probably get a 50-50 deal, mm. you know, out of it where you can still get some of the publishing and writer's credit. But if you do it afterwards, you're going to have to relinquish 100% of it, period. And you might have to pay a fine because of it. It's, so, and I've been, an expert, I've been an expert witness on a lot of copyright infringement cases, so I've seen it all. <laughs> no, it's the same as uh, better, to, better to buy that candy bar from the store rather than shoplift it. You'll, uh, you'll get in a lot more trouble for that. Uh, exactly. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about uh, about Chicago and, and house music's roots in Chicago, which is obviously you know deeply um, covered in your in your book in their own words. Um, and I think the other thing that's that's really apparent in this book is that you know talk about the 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 origination of of house music, but what is really apparent in the book is that it's all of these things are an evolution. You know, you talk about the evolution. From kind of Motown R&B soul and that transforming into into disco and then disco sort of transforming into uh, into house music um, and if we want to go further back of course you can talk about blues jazz etc which transformed into into the R&B soul and, and, and Motown so you know it's a it's a huge long progression but I think mm -hmm. the interesting thing is that Chicago was the town which had the famous Disco Destruction Rally in, in 1979, where everyone was like, disco sucks, and, and that everyone said, disco is dead. Um, and yet, you know, if, if you look at house music or electronic dance music today as a progression on disco, disco was stronger than ever, right? And well, yeah, and I mean, people, I think, take that whole... It's the disco demolition thing has really been blown out of proportion because honestly, it didn't affect anything or anybody. Disco kept on doing its own thing, which is how we got the house in the first place. It, it was something that was a story, you know, media latched on to it, but who cares about the media? Disco and house have never been concerned about the media. I mean, in terms of how they push out what the sound is. It's like, we've always had our sound, and we're always going to have our sound. We're always going to have our movement, no matter what, you know, commerciality talks about, how good, big, or small, or whether it's working or whether it's not. It's always going to be there, period. And that's the thing. It's like, from a commercial standpoint, a lot of people, when I've done documentaries and features, they always want to talk about disco demolition because they, they like the story of out of the ashes of disco demolition came house music. They love that. It's a, it's a great tagline for them. But unfortunately, that really wasn't what happened. <laughs> you know, what happened was, you know, disco had its movement, you know. And, and of course, disco comes from the word discotheque just so everybody understands. It's like, it's not something that just became a jazz or a blues or a rock. It's like somebody shortened disco from discotheque, 
music that was played at the disco, just like with the warehouse. It's not this major phenomenon. It comes from the warehouse. They shorten house out of warehouse, and that's why they call it house music. I mean, these are no-brainers, and people try to rack their brain and come up with all kinds of explanations as to why. Or it could have been this. It's not critical thinking, you all. It's real simple. It happened because people are very, very enthusiastic about using acronyms, shortenings, and things like that. And it's like, it was a natural thing to happen. So I, I say that because I, I, I just get so many people that ask me a question, well, well, what was the real, I was like, it's not a, it's not a big rocket science thing. It's like real simple, you know? But anyway, get back to your question. The whole thing with disco was just kind of a, you know, it, it thrived in the gay clubs and things like that. You had the LB, LGBTQ community that was very supportive of it. You know, a lot of times people want to say house came from, you know, the warehouse and all those clubs. It didn't really come from there. You know, honestly, where it came from was young teenage boys and girls in high school that were exposed to this sound. Because think about it. If something happens in a club that holds 150, 200 people, right, that is membership only, meaning that they're not letting anybody else inside. Mm -hmm. And they were this way because they wanted to keep their gay community close and safe and together, right? Well, if it happens in there, 99 times out of 100, nobody else is going to really know about it, sure. right? So it wasn't until a com more commercial type of people, such as my brother Wayne Williams. He, he's really the catalyst that kind of took that sound and said, I want to break this to the straight community, to people who don't understand it or haven't heard it, but I think it will be something that's, that's amazing for them to hear and to understand. He was the visionary behind all that. People want to give it to Frankie Knuckles. and I, it, it wasn't Frankie that did that. As much as I love Ron Hardy as my boy, it wasn't Ronnie that did that. Uh -huh. It was having having an outlet outside in a more commercial aspect yeah. is basically what it is. And, you know, people have always said things to me like, you've always tried to make house music commercial. I'm like, well, duh. Don't you want people to hear it? It's like, what do you want to do? Just play it for yourself at home? <laughs> you know, it's like the whole point of making music is because you want people to enjoy it. Yeah. So why should I just keep it in this little shell somewhere and not have it? I mean, think about it. Had I not had a vision to, to say, let me do something and release something that is, you know, a record that people can enjoy because it was something that I was already playing in a bigger club. I played at the playground. We had 1,500 people a night. That's a bigger. And I played a very big cross section of music from reggae to new wave to electronic hip hop. I mean, Soul Sonic Forest and, you know, Alexander Robotnik Italian. I play everything through the full spectrum. And the reason why the on and on tracks were special was because I purposely made them for a real purpose. I made them to segue between tracks. When you're going from 150 BPM to 80 BPM, you need something to get you there. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing at the time to do that. So I just brought out a drum machine and started changing tempos and changing almost like edits in terms and places that would actually make you feel where I could do cut time. And for you people don't don't know what cut time is, it's like I can take something that's 150 BPM and play it at the same speed, but it's 75 BPM. That's kind of like what you have when you listen to like um, jungle and dr drum and bass. That's what they do a lot, right? So understand another thing you have to understand music it was another misconception that most djs in chicago thought that because i was a dj that they could do it too that was the greatest thing that happened though that they didn't understand though was that i had a very vast musical education i understood song structure i understood tempo and everything so i knew that i could do it in cut time i knew that i could do it in three-quarter time or whatever because the tempos range within the same thing when you start breaking them down you know in <clears throat> excuse me, in fractions like that. So anyway, make a long story short, I started doing that for Segways, and it just so happened that the store where they gave me most of my records that I played called Imports Etc. in Chicago, you know, the guy Frank Sales, who was the, the best salesman there, I, I love Frank, he was, he was a great guy, right? He's your typical, like, you know, North Broadway gay guy with the mustache and everything, but he was so cool. I mean, it, it was like, like, you know, in those days, as that movement started to happen, you know, you, you started to mingle more with the gay community because we love the music and they love the music, right? So it became this whole 
just mash up of nobody cared what you were. They didn't care whether you were black, white, straight, gay, whatever. We love the music and all we wanted to dance to dance and make it, right? So anyway, he comes to me one day and he says, you're playing something that people do not know what it is. I'm, they're asking me and I can't figure for the life of me, he knows every record, right? This is the guy you always ask when you want to know what it is. He's like, I know everything in here. I know every record I give you, but I can't for the life of me figure out what this is. So I, I went and made a tape one night and I brought it back to him. And he played it in the store and somebody came up and identified it. It's like, that's what we're looking for right there. And he asked me, he says, well, what is this? I said, oh, that's just tracks I do on my 808, on my drum machine, right? And he's like, well, if you could get some of these pressed, we could sell hundreds of them because people are just asking, like, after writing. I was like, ding, <laughs> a bell goes off in my head. So I'm like, you know, let me figure out how do I press records. So that's when I, I, around the time that I met Vince Lawrence, and his father had a label called Mitch Ball, and he had done a record for his high school graduation. His father let him go in the studio called Fast Cars. And in his words, he said he was trying to make music like what I was playing. It just didn't come out that way because the drummer played too fast, and he had more of a ear, like a new wave style, because he wanted to be a band and the whole nine yards. So it, it became out being more of a new wave type record as opposed to a, a soulful or funky disco record, like can't fake the feeling or, you know, those kind of things at that time. So anyway, I said, well, you know, that's great. And I, you know, I'd play his record every now and then because I didn't know anybody that made a record before but him, right? So I was like, cool, let me see if I can break your record and everything. So consequently, he kind of like, he became my light man eventually, and, which was great because at that point I could really pick his brain. And he took me over to see Larry Sherman at Precision Record Labs, which was the only pressing plant in town, and said, this is how you do it. We make labels and they make stampers, masters, blah, blah, blah. Records come off. We shrink wrap them, put them in covers. I was like, God, perfect. Perfect. I went over, my first run was 500 copies. I took 250 over to Imports, etc., gave a copy to, you know, other key DJs in town, like the Hot Mix 5 was big on WBMX at that time, and so on and so forth. Put up posters like we would do for the parties and whatnot, and that record took off. In two days, they were ordering more. Brought them back probably another 500 or more the next time. Each time the order would just double until there was one point that every store in the city was just calling. It's like, we need some copies of this on and on record. People are coming in here. And I mean, and that's why I say in those days, we used to be able to sell so many records. I mean, here you are, a kid barely 20 years old, you know, set up, I had a, a record company set up in my grandmother's basement next door, hired my friends to work it from distribution to promotion and you name it. And here it is, we are selling more records than Madonna and Prince. We were number one on every single chart all over the city. Radios, it wasn't even a radio record, but they were playing it. It was top of, and I'm sitting there like, how in the world did this all happen? Because all I did was like, play some tracks and get some press, and it just became this phenomenon. But the beauty that came from that, as I said, was most other DJs in town saw what I was doing, mm. saw that I was knew I was a DJ, and they were DJs, so why can't they do the same thing? Mm. And that, I think, is the best thing that happened in the beginning of house music, was it enabled people an opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have had. So now you have the Marshall Jeffersons of the world. You have the Byron Stingleys. You have, I mean, just big Steve Hurley's and C.C. Penistons and the, the Crystal Waters. And it just became bigger and bigger and bigger as we went along. Next thing I know, I look at, at the charts in the U.K. and we're top of the pops. You know, a pop record, a, a house record made for an underground crowd becomes a pop record. Not only does it become a pop record, but it goes number one in about 25 countries. And the whole time I'm still scratching my head like how did this happen and you get people they'll ask me well how did you do that and i'm like i don't know it just happened <laughs> you know and i'm still here trying to figure out how, how yeah. did things uh, change when uh, when the music you know when that that spark lit a fire in uh, you know that that spark that came from from high school parties in in chicago um and and small you know clubs with 150 people in them Suddenly it's getting, you know, on the pop charts in, in the UK or Germany and, and Italy. And the music is, is then being, uh, being made and reinterpreted by people in, uh, in other countries, you know, over in, over in Europe or, or, or Britain, whatever it may be. How, how did things evolve at that point or change um, when, it, when it went international? Well, for me, 
I I started obviously the the first record on and on was January of 1984. So between that time and I'd say May or June of 1986, when we had just completed Love Can't Turn Around, I had started Trax Records, Dance Mania Records, and had outlets for all all DJs to put their stuff out. I was doing probably 10, 15 records at a time under different names because I didn't want everything to be Jesse Saunders or whatever. So that movement was going on like in building real quickly. So by I'd say when Love Can't Turn Around was released in I think May of 86, I got a record deal, I think that same month mm. with Geffen, Warner Brothers. Yeah. And for the next few months, I was in the studio. I wasn't really DJing or doing anything anymore because I was constantly trying to, you know, produce and write. And then I moved to LA, probably the the end of '86, and we went on. We actually went on a 20, 29 city tour of the UK in October of that year when Love Can't Turn Around reached the top of the top, wow. and top of the pops rather. Yep. And after that, I moved. So for me. Everything as far as Chicago was concerned, like ended because I was no longer really involved in it at that point. I was on a whole what I thought I was on a different level and in a different place. And now that I'm with the real money and the, the real people that I'm writing with these big writers and producers and everything. And, and as I said, in those days as a DJ, we didn't make much money. So I didn't feel like I was really leaving anything behind. It was like this was just the next level for me, you know. So. A lot of things happened in those years that I was in L.A. from end of 86 to the end of 89. So about three years, a lot of things happened, you know, that I wasn't really around or privy to because I really wasn't paying attention. Because unlike now where we're connected through the Internet and whatnot, we didn't have a way to be connected then. So what was going on in L.A. with me was not heard or known to anyone that was going on in Chicago and vice versa, yeah. you know. So when I came back for about a year and from 89 to the beginning of 90, it was a whole new, and it didn't even change then. Now acid was a big thing. Now hip house with rapping, it was a big thing. It, it changed completely. So, you know, and then I left again in 90, moved back to LA. So again, I'm back in studio all the time and I'm working all the time. So I kind of have tuned out a lot in between until someone told me that they were going to Europe now and performing and they're paying you two thousand dollars for an hour set. Uh -huh. And I'm like, not not only are they paying you two thousand dollars for an hour set, but they're flying you over, putting you in the best hotel, whining and dining you, and everything. And I'm sitting here like, how did this happen? <laughs> and how can I be a part of it? So I I started touring again in about '94 and never stopped since. But it was like I said, there was there was a good eight year period where I was kind of tuned out in terms of the DJ world. Okay. Okay, yeah. I, 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 I realize that we're, that we're running out of time and I think, you know, it's important, um, obviously the world and the United States in particular is going through quite a period of, uh, of disunity and uh, disharmony. Um, and as you were saying a couple of minutes ago, you know, house music started out as this, as this really amazing um, means of, of bringing people together, whether that was, you know, original states is bringing together gay and straight, black and white, all races, all sexualities, all genders, etc. cetera, um, creating unity. The same thing happened in the United Kingdom. You had people who were, you know, soccer hooligans, really violent guys who suddenly became, you know, much more friendly and were hugging each other on the dance floor and all of that sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, we just had uh, a few years ago after, after Frankie Knuckles passed away, um, the president of the United States, Barack Obama, you know, came out and said Frankie's work helped open minds and, and bring people together, which I think, you know, that must blow your mind when the president of the United States is talking about this type of music, which, uh, which you've helped. helped. Yeah. But is, is my question is Well, hold on. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say something to that before you go on. Behind every story is another story. Okay. So let, let me give you a piece that most people wouldn't know about that, right? Okay, so... As a teenager, growing up, freshman, sophomore, junior years, there were certain schools in the city, Whitney Young, Kenwood, University of Chicago High School, Mendel, so on and so forth that you'll hear about, you read, I'm sure, 
that were these kids whose mothers and fathers were judges, lawyers, doctors, politicians, you know, the more upper middle class kind of vibe that were more entitled and so on and so forth. Those were the people who spread house music, okay? And because of that, you have people like who we now know as Michelle Obama, uh-huh. Yeah. Who is not? She, she wasn't an Obama then. Obviously, she was another kid going to Whitney Young, who used to come to the parties and hang out with her. So we've known Michelle the whole time, long before she ever got with Barack, right? And when she did get together with him, and they did become a couple and get married and so on and so forth, Barack was part of our scene too. Barack was a househead long before everybody knew he had anything to do with house, but we knew. He was there with us. He was hanging out the whole night. Yeah. So when you look at something like he recognized Frankie and whatnot, it wasn't that he recognized Frankie because he wanted to rec- that That wasn't his thing. What he did was Alan King, who was my brother in The Chosen Few, and Barack are best friends. Uh-huh. Okay. Alan has always been really tight and close to Frankie. That's his person. So when Frankie died, Alan wanted to give him a tribute. So he had Barack do this whole thing. Hmm. So I'm not saying that, that Barack wouldn't have done it himself. All I'm saying is there was a catalyst there that made something like that happen. And it was because of a long-lasting relationship that really had absolutely nothing to do with him. Yeah. So, you know, it's nice that we, you know, that it, that it was done. But like I said, you know, even the evolution of how house music started, what you think is not necessarily what the story is. It's a whole different story behind the story. Well, and that's why anyone who's who's watching this, yeah. episode, uh, who's watching back uh, on the record, thoroughly encourage you to uh, to check out Jesse's uh, new book in their own words, which uh, which gives some, as you say, it's you know it's really unique perspectives uh, um, from yeah, not necessarily superstar big names, but uh, but yeah, people who were there on the ground when it was happening. Well- and that's the thing. I didn't want big names. That was the whole thing. Everybody, I, I tell you, my editor, my publicist, everybody, else, well, who are some of the names that are in this book? Because, you know, they're always looking for something that they can use as a tagline or who's in feature. I was like, there aren't any. And they're like, huh? It's like, I'm, there aren't any. It's like, I'm the closest you're going to get to it. Because what I want to do is feature real people with real story. I could care less who's a celebrity, how many followers you have. That's not what this is about. These are real people and they're real story. And if, and if people are not interested in real people, then we really have a problem right now because everything can't be about a celebrity or somebody you know. Mm. There are people who have, who have things to tell you and things to relate that nobody else could give you. Absolutely. And I would rather give their perspectives on it because those are the real stories. You think about anybody that's a name or a celebrity, they're going to tell the story in a manner in which skews toward them. Yeah. They're going to embellish themselves in the story. They're going to tell you things that aren't necessarily true. And there's so much of that out there, you know, and I just get tired of it. So I'm like, you'll, you'll find the real stories here. You'll find what the truth is. Not the embellished truth, not not the media sensationalized truth, but the real truth. And that's what I've been seeking for a long time in this culture we call house music and electronic dance music, because we just don't get it a lot, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Final, <laughs> final thing I'll ask you, Jesse, is, uh, and, and it's going kind of back to my, my last question before we were uh, uh, mm-hmm. Obama, um, you know, is, is house music still a, a force for, for unity, despite the fact that, you know, today, um, you know, so many nightclubs are, you know, multi-million dollar, they're businesses, you know, and they're places where a lot of the people, um, you know, you have to guarantee to spend $10,000 and you've got a table and you've got the bottle service and you've got all of these people coming out with sparklers and, and, and yada, 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 which, you know, it wasn't like that in 1990 when I started going out, let's say. Um, no, no. It was, it was about the music. Yeah. We gathered and we got together because we loved the music. We loved the music and we loved to dance to it. 
Mm. That was what it was. It does things, did things to your body, made you move a certain way, brought out a feeling of euphoria, nothing but love. You know, I always use the the analogy of like you can take a person, put him in a hip hop club or a rock or metal club, and put him in a house club. He'll be a different person in pretty much every one of those clubs. More so, like the rock and hip hop club are probably the closest because you know that that kind of breeds that edge, and you know it's more for lack of a better word, violent in terms of like how you deal with things. But you, you take those same people that would be ready to fight with you in, in a rock or a hip hop club, put them in a house club, you bump into them, all they're going to do is give you a hug and say, it's okay, brother. You know, it's all love. They won't do that anywhere else. Yeah. You know, so, so house music in itself just breeds that feeling of love and understanding. And we accept everybody. We don't care who you are. You know, it's like if you love the music, we love you. It's real simple. So house music will always be there in one way, shape, or form. I mean, you think about all these different styles that are out now that are subgenres and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, people that, that love them either still love house as, as its most traditional thing or eventually they come right back around and it becomes up. Because I always say that, like, the younger people want the harder, faster stuff, right? Sure. As you get older and you become more mature, you look for substance. So they find themselves right back around the house music. Yeah. So, you know, it's always going to be there in one form or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the book, um, you know, 120, 125 BPM, that's that's the rhythm. Well, number one, it's it's the same as your brain's um, cycle. Your heartbeat. Mm -hmm. You're here in the womb, so you know it's, uh, it's exactly, yeah, exactly. Well, and so every day, just just so we get this plug in real quick, yeah. I feature people who have these real stories in my book in their own words. I do it at 6 p.m. over here Pacific time, which is 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's 2 a.m. in the UK, and down in Australia, I think it's something like 10 or 11 a.m., but you can tune in, and I feature a couple of people from the book who can give you the stories again behind the stories and why they felt the way they had. They might, they'll probably include things that they weren't even able to put in the book, but it's nice to have those conversations with everyone, and they're from all over the world. So you're not getting just one perspective of one place. You're getting many different ones, but the thing that, that occurs within that whole Whole, whole hour of what we do is that you start to hear people talking from their heart things that really affected them changed the course of their life uh, i get so many stories about house music saved my life it's just unbelievable you know and even though doing it every day feels like a job and i say that all the time because i've never had a job in my life nor do i ever want to have one <laughs> But I said, this feels way too much like a job. <laughs> but I think it's important because, you know, it, people are now are starting to, like, tune in and understand that, A, this is a global phenomenon. Because, I mean, anywhere you are, to you local, you think that this is, you know, in my town or in my space or city, this is what's happening. Well, no, it's happening everywhere. That same feeling you have, the same reason why you go out, the same reason why you love the music is the exact same reason that somewhere halfway around the world is doing it. Mm. You know? And I think it's real important. Like I said, that's why I wrote the book in their own words, because I wanted to keep things in their words, the way they say it, the passion they feel in the whole nine yard. And the thing that's really surprised me about doing this is that we went up for pre-release in mid-May and Ever since day one, we've been the number one seller on Amazon. And thinking about the climate and the time that we're in is amazing to me because my publicist, you know, from the beginning, you know, we, we did the press releases, we did everything. She came back to me <laughs> one day after and she said, you know, I don't think this, this is going, we're going to get any coverage. And I'm thinking like, well, why not all coverage? You know, I always get a feature somewhere or a story or a review or whatever. She's like, no, you're not going to get it now. I'm like, well, why? She said, because I've talked to the editors and they basically stated that if it didn't have anything to do with the Black Lives Matter, uh, the Floyd case or protest, they're not going to feature it. And I'm thinking like, oh, that's not good. It's like, how do I get my big book promoted now? And then she's like, well, you're just going to have to wait. So that's what made me start to discover alternative means of promoting it. I mean, yes, of course, you posted the 
IG. Yes, of course, you post on Facebook and you do your tweets. And you do, of course, that's that's a given. But I had to think of more creative ways to actually promote it. And coming up with this live thing has actually been a godsend because I think since we started that, we started on the day that the book was released. I mean, sales were great before, but they've like probably tripled since then. And you know, just all the little things that we're doing, I was, I was like, I'm, shoot, I saved myself a lot of money. I didn't have to pay a publicist to do, so it was actually well, good. I, I think, uh, you know, as I said, I think your publicist uh, is wrong because there's a, you know, there's a strong theme of, uh, of, of unity and, and, and harmony that's, uh, that's running through the stories in this book. And I think there could be nothing more relevant than, uh, than that right now, you know, uh, in a time of... Well, yeah, I would hope so, but the problem was the editors of the, you know, the major publications, the Rolling Stones, the DJ magazines, the so on and so forth, Mix Mag, you name it, weren't taking anything. They were like just on hold. So it didn't matter how good or what the great the message was, they just would not take it. Yeah. Right now, it's like you have to wait till this time when we start back with blah, blah, blah. And then even like the local publications, local news, local newspapers, so on and so forth, same thing. They just didn't want to take it. There were maybe three or four that did. And, you know, that was great. But a lot of them we couldn't get coverage on because of it. Well, I'm, I'm going to do my So, uh, yeah, but look. Well, I, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you. Pleasure. And look, as I said to you, um, you know, you and I have been uh, following one another on, on Instagram for uh, for a while now, and it's um, look, man, it's it's always it's always a thrill when I see that uh, Jesse Saunders has liked one of my posts. That's kind of uh, yeah, <laughs> a bit exciting for me. But um, it's been it's been a real privilege and a real pleasure to uh, to speak with you today, and you've been so generous with your uh, with your time. So uh, I thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone who's who's been listening in. Um, lots of lots of comments and things there. Um, so thank you, guys. Thank you, Hybrid Fan Three, for uh, for checking in so much. Thank you to my friend Nikki uh, who had some questions. But uh, yeah, most of all, thank you, Jesse, and thank you for the music, as they say. Um, oh. It's been a real thank pleasure. you. And and look, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. Look and let's stay in touch. For sure. Thank you again. I mean, as I said, the whole thing for me has just been about connecting with people and getting the real heart and soul of things. And I don't care who you are, what, I mean, you could be a big journalist, you could be a small, you could be just a regular person. I pretty much try to talk to everyone that's interested in talking to me. Mm -hmm. So, Great. there you have it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, as I say, super kind and, and super generous with your time. So uh, thank you once again, Jesse. I had a thousand more questions to ask you, but... Uh, uh, we can do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. <laughs> probably, 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 uh, and we'll touch base on that. But uh, yeah, once again, great pleasure. Take care. All the best. And thank you once again to uh, everyone who's, uh, who's tuned in today or who's watching this on the, uh, on the recording. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Peace. Until next time. Yeah, peace. Exactly. Take care. Oh, we need it. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye.